If there's no burning questions, I'll move on to the next one. And he's sat right next to me. And this is Mpasi Siame. And uh, he's, he's at the Leicester Fire and Rescue Service, uh, Equalities and Diversity Officer. And he's, he's been there 10 years. He's been there a long time, so very experienced. So welcome. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Um, and I would first like to uh, echo the sentiments around being given the opportunity to come here and speak from both a professional capacity but also a, a personal capacity around um, diversity and multiculturalism and what it means for Leicester. I find that to be quite an interesting uh, topic when I was invited and obviously I look forward to coming along and participating in the debate and the discussions. Um, as I've been introduced, I'm um, Pazi Siame, uh, 10 years service in the Fire and Rescue Service as an advisor to the Fire Authority, but also probably 16 years uh, industry uh, involvement in equality, diversity and inclusion. So there is some knowledge that I would like to think I come with. Uh, so, you know, talking about uh, um, what does diversity and multiculturalism mean for, for Leicester. I thought the first important aspect to look at is how do we understand those two terms. If we are talking from the same kind of perspective, then we'll probably understand it in the same way that, you know, we do. So, from a personal point of view and from my um, uh, work that I do, I look at diversity from the very simplest form of being different. Okay, so I start from that angle to say, yes, people are different, and because of that, because of the differences, we tend to have to find means of interacting that is fair and reasonable for everybody around us. But then, I, then again, I thought about the concept of multicultural societies, and I said, well, yes, diversity exists, it can exist within a white British setup because factors that create diversity are varied, they're not necessarily on multicultural aspects, but could be because of different aspects of where people grow up, where you, the schools you went to, uh, your understanding, what political affiliations you have, so that creates diversity itself. But we're talking about multicultural diversity, people from different cultures living in a city of Leicester. And from that angle, my thoughts were to say, you know, and I'm speaking predominantly from the public sector view. The kind of challenges that that brings, the kind of exciting moments that brings. So from that I thought, well, yes, I've heard reference to say, you know, we are on Nabra Road, probably one of the most multicultural roads or streets in the UK. Absolutely true. You know, and then you think to say, well, you know, we have moments to celebrate that diversity, but do we really understand some of the challenges that having such a diverse uh, society or region presents? And in my arguments and my conversations today, I would like to think or rather focus particularly on how that diversity impacts on public services. I tend to have a view, this is my personal view, and I would I'll be challenged by scholars, uh, which are welcome, to say we are and we do celebrate uh, multiculturalism in Leicester in a very uh, progressive way, in that we recognize differences, we recognize the kind of uh, lovely attributes that brings us nice food from different parts of the world, you know, everybody's favorite dish being the curry, and we look at those things and celebrate that very, very well. However, there's the other side of uh, multicultural societies which have a direct impact on public services. Okay, I'm not talking about public services because people coming into the country are now way, uh, overweighing our demands on the medical side, but I'm talking about how we in the public service respond to that. Are we adequately informed to be able to provide a service that meets the needs of the multicultural <laughs> backgrounds that we are now responsible or equally involved in providing the service to. I, I tend to argue that we are not because we tend to 
look at groups of people and put them in pigeonholes, help sometimes, but then rely on that pigeonhole in how we are shaping, how we're shaping the services that we're trying to provide. Just as an example, what I'm trying to say there is to say I would take people of African background as a discussion point. So I would say as a public organization, we would happily collect information about people coming from, you know, from, an Af from the African continent. Within that are challenges because it is not a homogeneous culture that comes with that. It is a diverse culture. There's a range of cultures that come within that breakdown, but I think we are ignorant of that as public services, and that creates a challenge. Uh, that is the kind of thinking that I'm trying to bring to, to the table and to the conversation. And therefore, I do believe that uh, within the public sector, we miss the opportunity to understand and to break down the multicultural societies that exist within our area of provision of service and how what we provide would then meet each and every contributions that are part of our society. And I think that's a very, very big challenge. Addressing those challenges is a big question because I do think some of uh, what Dr. Okay. shared is to say there are structural issues in how we look at diversity, how we look at multicultural societies, and how we respond to that. And I think that's not different in public services. We find that people um, who are uh, particularly, say, immigrants, will tend to accommodate a lot more of the lower-based uh, career paths, if you're looking at careers, and therefore how much that involvement in public service shapes the higher levels of decision-making, which become slightly less diverse, and therefore the mechanism to inform becomes less and less to go up the line. Uh, empowerment within those uh, multi, multicultural backgrounds within the workplace, again, is another challenge that I can speak for most uh, public sector organizations. is a challenge that we continue to struggle with to attract the right people into the right levels to be able to inform some of the things that we do. Um, as an example, I think, you know, within the Chef and Rescue Service, uh, we have carried the duty to, to make safe everybody who lives, works, and enjoys the life of, of Leicester. However, it only took a very, very, very specific interest from the University of Leicester to approach us to try and look at understanding the causes of fire, which communities are affected, particularly more affected, uh, worse affected, severe fires, if you like, uh, in a study which obviously got an interest from our, from our senior management, and we've participated fully in this uh, research project since. And for the first time, it brought out an issue that, again, directed an interest to say, people who are more likely to suffer a fire and more likely to suffer a severe fire are people of, of African background, but very specific to people who are new in our communities. I don't think or don't believe without that particular interest from the University of Leicester that we in the fire service, as a service provider with public responsibilities to provide safety would have ever begun to understand that dynamic and how it impacts on people living and working in Leicestershire. So it is a kind of an example that shows to say, yes, we acknowledge the diversity of Leicester, but how far do we go in understanding how the services that we provide as public sector impact on each and in individual backgrounds of you know, the communities that we are, we, we are providing a service to? That remains a challenge, and in my personal view, is that some of that work and conversations, such as we are having today, provide a basis to challenge our thinking and perhaps change the focus of how we interact with diverse communities in the communities that we are providing a service to.
and I welcome the opportunity that I've been able to come here and speak and be part of the book discussions today. Thank you, thank you very much. Phase one was to dissect the data yeah. and therefore identify the patterns of where people who suffer most, uh, their backgrounds and where they like to. So we've done the phase one. Right. We are now, and I would make the appeal, we are now pushing into phase two okay. to try and engage with some of the communities that have been identified within that. Yeah. So we are doing some work with particularly uh, African communities. Uh, and hence, I'm, I'm assuming that my call to Ambrose to say, well, I'll need to talk to you about some of the work that I'm doing, drove Ambrose to invite me to come and have some of these conversations. So we're moving towards phase two of having some conversations. Yeah. And I would welcome any support that people might have. I'd love to meet Ambrose. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Because we can share details and we'll share the first uh, part of the phase, or the first report from, from, from the second. Thank you very much.